So for those who uh, came yesterday to um, the climate change session, you might see some different pictures today, I hope. Um, uh, so I'll give you a, a quick uh, rundown of uh, CITIZEN, the Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeological Network. Um, so I talked about citizen science yesterday as a very useful tool um, for monitoring uh, coastal intertidal archaeology that's at, at risk. Um, uh, we've seen this slide before. So we're based at three different offices so that we can access um, the coast easier and support our, our volunteers um, more quickly. Um, and with Nautical Archaeology Society, Council for British Archaeology, and Museum of London Archaeology. Um, so citizen science is involving um, non-professional scientists into data collection and its analysis. As that's a key thing to point out. It's not just about data collection. Um, it's about the full process. Um, I'll give you a quick little uh, look at some of the things we've been looking at. So when we talk about coastal archaeology or intertidal archaeology, um, people think of uh, usual maritime uh, kind of things, subjects like vessels. Um, but also we've been looking at uh, sort of different types of coastal archaeology. So this is a former atomic weapons research establishment um, on the coast, uh, which we were uh, assured never actually had any live nuclear weapons in it, but we'll see how that goes. Heck of a risk, risk assessment. <laughs> but um, here we've got some volunteers looking at a um, sort of aerial bombardment target, uh, which is now uh, eroding out of the shingle. It's very active around here. Um, that lighthouse is not looking so good either, um, but that's another story for another time. Uh, we look at more ephemeral things. These are prehistoric footprints uh, preserved into laminated silts um, at Formby and Merseyside. You find them all around the coast um, in England. Um, so you can see little crisscrosses of uh, feet here and here um, and animal tracks as well. Um, these usually only last for a few tidal cycles before they're washed out. Um, and so I'll mention this later, but it's very important to have a rapid recording tool for things like this because they can be so quickly lost. Um, and it's very important for people who can recognize them to t take pictures right away. Um, so on that note, we've, uh, we do um, a series of outreach and uh, training program. So training is essential, like I said, with those footprints, you wouldn't notice that they were uh, prehistoric otherwise. Um, so here's a little workflow for you. Um, so we, we raise awareness of archaeology even being on the coast in the first place. Um, uh, through sort of national outreach, um, especially using the media. Um, then we do local outreach, that's more direct, actually talking to people, um, shaking hands on the ground, etc., cetera, um, and making it fun. So people want to actually keep coming back, because especially when good tides usually are around very early in the morning. <laughs> so if it's not fun, people won't come. Um, and, uh, and training, so again, developing those skills so that you can recognize this kind of archaeology um, and what's at risk, what does risk mean? Um, and then that eventually, hopefully, would lead into a sort of long-term monitoring because they want to keep doing it. It seems fun to them to keep monitoring this archaeology. Uh, so what have we been up to? Uh, well, we give, do a lot of, uh, like I said, outreach and training, but it's more outreach because, of course, you want to raise that message uh, first um, because you can't just jump straight into the training. No one will show up. So uh, we do a lot of different kinds of things, talks, walks, lectures, etc. Because not everyone's interested in the same kind of thing. <laughs> so, um, so that's giving you an idea of that. We'll give you some numbers later if you want. Um, and uh, we, were, we were tasked in our three and a half years funding from Historic uh, Heritage Lottery Fund uh, to, um, to carry out a certain amount of outreach and a certain amount of training. Um, and it was so popular, actually, that we didn't think, we weren't sure how many people would show up to a, a muddy uh, beach. Uh, in Essex, for instance, um, but it turns out lots, lots of people were really into it. So um, without much more effort, uh, we, we, we went really over target for the numbers of people we're reaching. So this is actually quite an interesting subject to a lot of people. So that was quite cool for us. Same with the training. Um, a lot more people showed up than we expected. Great. <laughs> that was awesome for us. Um, and uh, yeah, they're all still smiling in those pictures, as you can see, hopefully. Um, I mentioned yesterday about um, the smartphone apps was developed uh, using the same web developers as the Sharp app, the award-winning Sharp app. Um, and, uh, but it, just, it, it has GPS built in. It, has, it allows you to take photos, and you have controlled fields, so it's a perfect recording tool 
for people to use. And most people have a smartphone in their pocket. Um, and like I said yesterday as well, it works offline. So people do not have to use their own data to use it. So it's again, trying to tackle that uh, technological poverty uh, that might be an issue for some people. Um, but we have um, extensive guidance online as well. So everything's free to use um, if people want, uh, want to do so. Um, so we've been working all around um, the coast, um, including the Owls of Scilly, which is a, a hoot, um, but uh, kind of mostly uh, doing reconnaissance work to see what's out there, um, because there's some baseline data surveys done in uh, beginning in the late 90s, um, and then some of those sites hadn't been revisited since. Um, so that was a big part of this project, was to, to galvanize local communities to to, to go and look at these again and see what has changed because a lot can change since 1997 um, and had done. Uh, so that was a big part of this project. And then to revisit sites that were important to, to other people as well. So we were working with a lot of local archeology span societies um, and then they would ask us for support. Um, so I'll quickly talk about um, our app as well. I'll give you a little bit of number crunching. So these are where um, anyone who provided us location actually do live. I wonder who those red dots in Scotland are <laughs> and Wales. <laughs> but, um, uh, so you can see there are um, differences in, in our region. So we are, we're divided into three regions to more easily access um, the coast from our offices. Um, uh, there are quite a few big dots in London because of the uh, Thames Discovery Program, as mentioned yesterday. There are big dots around Chichester from the local archaeology society there, as well as Morecambe Bay. Um, and 4% of uh, app users are located outside of England, including Wales, Scotland, um, America, Belgium, um, Barbados, there was one as well. So, you know, people are trying these things out. And because it's based on GPS, it, it can work anywhere. It's just there's no baseline data set in there. That's all. And moderating it would be a bit tricky because I wouldn't know what Barbados archaeology looked like. So there you go. <laughs> um, so I think you, you saw some of this uh, stuff yesterday. But uh, what is our data? So it's it's feature level data. Then underneath that, related condition surveys. So you can have multiple condition surveys for each type of feature, um, and and uh, then photos related to that. Um, and despite having 2,400 registered users. Um, only 166 active users. So people are using it as a contextualization tool and not, we're not forcing them all to update everything that they can see. It's just whoever wants to use it can use it. Um, so we have uh, 1,500 new features, um, including some footprints, like I said before, some peers. Uh, so historic peers have been added to it, um, which were more sticks in the mud then, um, and, and so forth. Um, so anything um, and pillboxes, pill anywhere in between. Um, like I said, hotspots here are mostly our key sites. So we've been focusing on some key um, areas around the coast, areas of sort of uh, high erosion or easy access uh, to local people. Um, so these are our updated features. You can then see um, the hotspot around London and uh, certain National Trust properties where they have a lot of volunteers who are using the app. So these are people who are updating existing um, uh, points and add, adding their own information and interpretation to it. Um, another sort of rapid recording tool that we use um, is photogrammetry. Um, it's gotten a lot cheaper to do this uh, recently. Um, so we can have volunteers who take photos themselves and then we process it for them. This one was uh, carried out with a drone, um, but some of our uh, volunteers actually have their own drones now because, like again, those have gotten cheaper as well. So, um, so certain volunteers who got a drone for Christmas, for instance, then go out and, and fly certain areas with us um, and uh, have produced some really amazing stuff. These is the, that particular survey style is really important in really sticky intertidal mud like here in Hull, um, where it would be too risky to go out there and survey those vessels um, on foot. Uh, so it's really useful. Uh, this is a mammoth tusk we found in uh, Mersey Island, Essex. So that is an easy solution to that question every archaeologist gets asked. What's the coolest thing ever found? Ta! -da! But uh, <laughs> uh, it was a kilometer offshore. So it was on a super spring low tide. And um, we had a high pressure day too. That was, that was pretty handy. 
Um, but it is two meters long, if you can tell from the tiny scale, and, um, and weighs a ton. So we, ha we could not take it with us. Um, and to lift these kinds of things, you have to pack it in plaster, you have to wrap it up in cotton wool, and you have to drag it with a sled and all this stuff. And we had about 30 minutes to look at this because of the tide window. So next best thing, um, we, had, we cleared away some of the gravels it was sitting in. And um, this is actually our volunteers took all these photos. They made sure they have their north arrow and scale in there, took all the photos around um, the object. And, um, and Dropbox them to us, and we created this. So it's sort of uh, the equivalent of Victorians making plaster casts of dinosaur bones. We have the data of it, but we don't have the object. So it's something we can look at. We took a sample of it as well, so the Natural History Museum are looking at that and trying to date it for us. Um, we, um, like I said yesterday, we give, uh, we have, uh, an, an annual conference so our volunteers can present their work to their peers. Um, so it's not just thank you very much for the data and we'll write it up for you. It's they get a chance to, use, to, to say what they have learned. Um, so this is one of our volunteers, Lawrence, from again from Mersey Island, um, talking about sites they've been looking at, including a lot of uh, Roman, unabraded Roman pottery that's, that's eroding out of somewhere. Um, so, uh, so that's pretty exciting. So that's, that's something we can then start looking into together because we can pull all of our resources from our partnership working and sort of throw it at that. Um, so pretty cool. And I'll just leave you with my last slide here. Um, uh, I think I flagged up yesterday that citizen science, it's not exploitation. It's not using people for their labor. It is working with people and making sure that they get something out of it as well. So it's about communicating your message and them understanding the value of what you're doing and them seeing a sort of tangible contribution to that as well. And I'm gonna leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>